Hello and welcome to Trees Atlanta's speaker series, Ask the Arborist. We're glad that you joined us today. My name is Rebecca Gilbert. I am the Associate Director of Education at Trees Atlanta. And we're excited to bring this um, to you uh, today to get your questions answered regarding uh, whatever might be kind of popping up in your world for our arborists. A little bit about Trees Atlanta. Trees Atlanta's mission is to protect and improve Atlanta's urban forest by planting, conserving, and educating. We'd love for you to get involved with all of the things that we're doing with Trees Atlanta, and I'll provide more information at the end of the program on how you can get involved. I wanted to welcome our panelists today. We have Susan Pierce Cunningham. She is the Associate Director of Volunteer Services at Trees Atlanta. And also today we have Tyler Baxter. He's the sales manager at Butte Tree. And there are arborists today and we have um, questions that we're gonna be sharing with, with them that you've asked previously. But also if you come up with a question during this program, we wanna make sure you have the opportunity to ask those questions of us. And so if you'll notice on your screen, you'll see a Q&A section that you can click on or a chat feature. And any time during the presentation, if you have a question that you haven't submitted beforehand and pops up into your mind, go ahead and put it there. I will be moderating those questions and uh, providing those questions to our panelists throughout the program. So be sure to check out that Q&A and the chat options. I'll be bringing this up at the end just as a, as a reminder, but think about as you're going through this program, you know, what you'd like to see more of, uh, less of, how we can improve and better serve you um, through this experience. So what I wanna do now is welcome our panelists to uh, our Ask the Arborist feature. So uh, we'll have Susan and Tyler come on board here and they will be, answering some of your questions. But first I want to let them have the opportunity to tell a little bit more about themselves and what they their specialties are. So Susan. Hi everyone, um, thanks for joining us. So I am the Associate Director of Volunteer Services. I'm also an ISA certified arborist as you saw. I love to learn about trees in our urban forests and I keep up my certification because I also train our volunteers on how to prune young trees. If you're interested in learning more about that, please uh, join me at a pruning class sometime. You can actually start out learning more about pruning via our virtual class, which is accessible on our website. And then you can come out to an in-person class. So I like to always give a plug for that because we need lots of help with it. I also help lead our tree keepers certification program where volunteers learn how to become leaders in their own communities or with the Trees Atlanta organization. And Tyler's actually helped lead some of those classes before. So thanks Tyler for joining us today. Do you want to tell everybody about yourself? Yeah, definitely. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'm a certified arborist. Um, I'm from the Atlanta area. Um, I went to school at Auburn University, and at that time, I had my heart set on being a forester and swore I'd never move back to the big city. Um, but after a few years, I decided to come back home, and um, I've been in Atlanta. I've been working with the private sector, just private tree care companies for 15, 16 years now. Um, I'm an arborist with Butte Tree, and um, the company that I work for, we have eight tree care crews, some do removals, we have cranes, we have a plant health care department. Plant health care is that term that you use for trying to take care of trees, um, whether it be soil care like we're talking about today or risk assessments or consultations. So we're here um, if anyone might need trees worked on on the private property, but people also use this for a resource and they, um, they call us for consultations as well. And we pride ourselves on, on being able to offer unbiased, the best that we can um, recommendations. It's not always just coming out looking for a removal or prune, pruning of trees. So um, soil care is something I'm passionate about. Um, it's something that's beneath our feet. We're always looking up, looking at the pretty trees. 
but it's something that I think there's there's a lot to be said for for taking care of our young and our mature trees. And um, yeah, I've, I've volunteered with Trees Atlanta um, about ten years ago. My wife, one of the first gifts she gave me was buying a tree as a gift. So obviously, Trees Atlanta is the go-to. I mean, she knew she was dating an arborist, and she had no clue what to give me, so she bought me a tree. So. Um, that just says how far reaching y'all are. And if anyone needs to look for advice, certainly Trees Atlanta is the first thing on people's minds. So I'm happy to be here um, and you know, share a little bit of what I know. Thank you, Tyler. And thank you, Susan, for being here and sharing your knowledge with the public. The more people that can get their questions answered and care for our trees and including the soil, you know, the, our canopy is going to be healthier and stronger. So thank you. And I want to go ahead and jump right into questions. Feel free um, to answer um, if it's your areas of specialty um, and, and kind of bounce ideas off of each other as well. So our first question talks about soil health. In what situations do you recommend soil testing? Do you only test for nutrients? The soil, yeah. So. I, soil testing is a part of soil management. I mean, even if we go into the doctor's office, we get our blood tested. Um, and so one of the, the different things that they test for in a soil test is nutrient levels, but they're also looking at pH levels. Um, there's some other variety, and those are when you collect a bag of soil, you send it in, the UGA extension is a great resource that people can do. Um, and you can just see what levels of nutrients you have in the soil, but um, the pH is a big one. And then there's other soil testing that involves compaction tests. So you can take a core sample out of the earth and you can take a look at, well, how, how is the soil made up? Is it really compacted clay or, you know, is it a more sandy kind of looser soil? Um, so I think we always want to look at, hey, let's send something in and let a, let, let's let a soil scientist give us some numbers back. But sometimes those soil tests and that exploratory work on site on a property or even in land is, is helpful. You don't always have to send it away and get an answer. Do you have situations where you just can immediately tell that this is absolutely too compacted or I just I just know that something's off and you don't even like go through the process of the soil testing? I mean there, that's right. I mean nutrient levels is a part of soil management but it's not the only thing. I mean, compaction and pretty much lack of organic matter I see as a more important issue. So um, if you're working in a really well-prepared, like high, you know, if you're working in an environment where the soil has already been taken care of for a number of years, yes, you start fine tuning the nutrient levels. But sometimes when we're working in the right-of-way strips where a lot of trees, Atlanta trees are planted or even front yards, I mean, just the foot traffic alone, I mean, it doesn't create a good soil environment for tree roots. So yeah, sometimes you just have to walk onto the property to feel it under your feet. Um, you know, no air, no water is getting done in that, in that soil. So I think soil testing, especially for nutrient levels can be helpful, but probably looking at compaction first is the way I look at things. I think, Right, finding out what you can maybe quickly visually find out and know kind of who to follow up with. Um, and that reference for cooperative extension could be helpful for folks too. Thanks, Tyler, for sharing that. Definitely. And along those lines, the question is, should I add amendments to the soil when planting a new tree? That's a good one. You find all sorts of different answers if you go online. What, what do y'all do, Susan? When you're planting a tree, do you always amend? No, we typically don't. More often than not, we're replacing what we dug out with the soil that came out of it. Mm. Um, the times when we have to amend is actually when we just don't have enough soil typically. If it was just a lot of rock, like big rocks or concrete, sometimes we'll have to go find extra soil to put in. But we always recommend when our volunteers are planting to use all of the soil that came out and put that back in. And I, I was taught, and what I share with the volunteers is that you also don't want to drastically change the texture of the soil in one area. So if you're planting a tree and you end up amending the soil a lot and it changes the texture, then 
the water flowing through the soil may not be able to move through as easily. It might stop in one area where the soil texture is different. So I have heard the rule that if you're amending, it should be no more than 10%, I think. Uh, Tyler, have you heard that? I haven't heard that exact number, but it's, it's, I think the point it's trying to make is don't dig a hole, get rid of all that soil and then put totally new soil around it. Um, yeah, I, I think you could, if you really wanted to do your best and you have one tree in your front yard and you're putting all your time and energy, in it, and energy into it, you know, add some compost into it. I don't think it's going to hurt as long as you're doing 10%. It can only help a little bit, but yeah, you kind of have to see what you're digging out of the hole sometimes before you put it back in. If you're pulling a lot of rock out or if you're just pulling out huge chunks of clay, something can be helpful in to kind of break that up because clay will squish down pretty, pretty quickly. And sometimes putting that, so, that compost on top, like before you put the mulch on can be really helpful too. That's true. I mean, just, just top dressing some soil and as long as it doesn't wash away at, over time, it can slowly work its way down into a hole. I mean, really planting a tree, if, if you dig the hole wide enough, I mean, I know this isn't a top, this isn't a discussion on tree planting, but as far as preparing the soil around a tree, just make sure that that hole is big enough. Make sure that you're, you're loosening all of the soil much larger than the tree that you're planting and that's going to get a, the tree a good chance to push the roots out and expand into that full that full area we used to use um we used to use those polymers like um terrasorb and things that are supposed to hold on to moisture longer and then release it into the soil as the soil dries out but um, we stopped mm -hmm. using it because we just felt like we didn't have quite enough information to know what's happening to those as they break down and are you know are we adding something back to our soil that could eventually be harmful if it got into our waterways so we stopped using mm -hmm. it it's kind of expensive too yeah it always depends on you know the the amount that you're willing to invest into the tree so i mean are you planting thousands of trees or are you planting that one specimen tree in the front yard um you know, my rule of thumb is it's probably not going to hurt, but um, it's not a requirement. It's definitely not a requirement. Yeah. That was all great. I think from different aspects from, you know, deep down as you're digging the hole, but also the top dressing was great information. Thank you. This is a, a question. Uh, I have an old water oak tree over 75 years old that looks thin up in the canopy. Should I consider adding any fertilizer to the soil around it? So, you know, it depends on what kind of fertilizer you're thinking about adding, but this kind of correlates with that answer I gave maybe about soil testing is that if you see some changes in the canopy, because that's, that's where we're looking for changes, right? Are the leaves, are there fewer leaves? Are the leaves smaller than they should be? Um, or in this case, it may sound like maybe some branches are losing leaves at the end, which is like dieback, if you will. I mean, those can be symptoms of stress for sure, but it may not necessarily be a symptom of like low nitrogen, a low phosphorus. There's 17 nutrients that trees deal with. So um, there may be other ways to address that stress besides just um, when I say 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, there's just like that basic fertilizer. It describes the nitrogen, the phosphorus and the potassium. Um, so that's really one where I would probably, if it's an, you said it was an old tree. Was that what the, what the question said? He's saying yeah. it was a over 75 years old tree. You gotcha. Yeah, that's an old water oak, right? Um, so it certainly could have a lot of life left in it. I would probably look, my, my first question usually is, does it have mulch at the base of it? Not right at the base of it, but you know, roots will go out as far as the branches, if not far further. So if you have bare soil with no mulch, start with that, you know, before you start like, you know, throwing the broadcaster out there, go into the, the home improvement store to buy fertilizer. Great, thank you. That kind of, you talk about roots and how far the roots stretch out. So this is, a, we have a couple of questions about that coming up. Uh, the question says, I have surface roots from a very large mature pin oak tree 
growing through my lawn. Can any of the roots be cut without endangering the tree? If so, what should be used to cut them? They extend out about 18 feet from the tree trunk. That's, some, that's that. a long way from the trunk. Yeah. yeah, I had that happen in my yard too, um, where the roots were so shallow and we kept mowing over mm -hmm. them and injuring them and I was worried about it. So we ended up just giving up on grass or weeds in our case. And we <laughs> created it a huge mulch area in our yard to cover those roots. Um, yeah. Tyler, what else do your clients do besides adding, is there anything besides mulch? I feel like mulch is like the answer all the time. I mean, mulch definitely is a fallback. I mean, the trees, anything we, we try to do to improve tree health, um, we're trying to recreate what the tree has out in the woods. So what we're trying to recreate that's still, you know, nice and neat and safe for us is some level of organic matter, leaves, wood chips, something that's breaking down where all those beneficial bacteria and fungi are. So what do you do? Giving up on grass can be hard sometimes, you know, especially if you only have that one small little piece and you work really hard to keep it nice and green. Um, there's two factors that affect grass and, and it's tree roots for sure. And also the shade. So if you're getting too much shade and there's roots there, those two don't always mix roots, or I'm sorry, grass and trees. So what do you do? Yeah, you cover up the area with mulch. Um, one of the reasons why I think other than maybe like red maples having shallow roots or pan oaks or some trees that are more prone to them having surface roots, one of the things I, I one of the reasons I think we have surface roots is that our soils are compacted. Trees were planted in an area and the soils are compacted and, and roots need, they need air and they need water. And if, if the, the area at the top of the soil is the most favorable for that, that's where the air and the water is, that's where they're gonna grow. And also maybe you get, maybe you get some erosion issues where the soil washes away. But um, in those cases, what do you do? I guess the question was, can you cut the roots? Well, if you're 18 feet away from the tree, you might be able to cut that root, but I would, I would consult an arborist. I would call, um, I would call a, either an arborist consultant or a tree care company where you feel like they're going to be giving you some good advice, not just out there trying to pitch a specific service, because there might be one root you can cut. And in that case, a clean cut on a root is better than, you know, hacking away with an ax. Or running over it with a lawnmower repeatedly like we were doing. Yeah, over and over and over again. Yeah. I mean, mulch truly, truly is the answer. And whether that mulch is just going to be covering the roots so you, you aren't mowing over it or you're not tripping on it, or over time, mulch as it breaks down will loosen some of that soil and maybe allow, maybe not the big roots to dive down. They're not going to do that, but it will encourage roots to grow deeper in the soil where there's a little more moisture. So in thinking of those, the, I'm hearing a common theme here about mulch. Mulch is a great uh, yeah. thing to have for your trees. So whether it's the red maple whose roots are on the surface getting cut, um, mulch might be a, a, a solution for that. The question was just making sure that whoever asked the question gets that answer. Should they give up trying to cut the grass around the red maple that's right at the, the surface and really look at just mulching that area? It, it's case by case, but it, it's grass, grass does not always blend with trees. So if it's one little area and one root, you, you might be able to get away with cutting that root to preserve the lawn. But, you know, there's a balance there. You may want to mulch one area, and then cut just one little root. But before you start hacking away on it, I would definitely ask a professional that you trust. Um, and 18 feet away from the tree, it's pretty good distance. I mean, it also might not even be that that tree's root, but but we do root pruning. It isn't a it is an approved service. You just kind of use it only when necessary. I've seen a long. Oh, go ahead, Susan. Sorry. Oh, some of my neighbors who have shallow rooted trees have like added topsoil on, an effort mm -hmm. to be able to grow grass on top of them, mm -hmm. and um, I've noticed it's a very temporary fix. For them, it doesn't seem to be affecting the trees at all, but the soil 
if they don't keep the grass seed up, the soil does eventually just kind of wash off and erode mm -hmm. away. Yeah, if you're gonna put loose soil on top of compacted earth, yeah. it's only so long that before that loose soil washes away. If nothing's so. holding it, yeah. Mm -hmm. You mentioned mulch. So is there is there a better type of mulch for trees? Any recommendations on how to get that mulch to your house? Oh, well, the best mulch is what comes from the tree, I think. Yeah. Whatever falls off your tree. Yeah. Pine needles, leaves, that's that's the best. But if you're gonna purchase it, then I don't know. I, I usually recommend just like, in our area, we have a lot of oaks. So that oak hardwood mulch is great because it stays in place. A lot of people like pine straw too. Tyler, we had this weird thing happen that I, I wanna bring up with pine straw. Um, we noticed that a, a set of trees that we had planted in a park, all the roots have been it looked like roots had been chewed on. And our theory of that was that maybe there was a small animal living under the pine straw, because this was an area yeah. where we had pine straw instead of hardwood mulch. And it seemed like it was like a nice little place for these little voles or whatever it could be that was chewing on the trees to just hide. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen that? Like, have you had other clients I who mean, their roots chewed on? I mean, that is a conversation I have all the time, whether, you know, you're looking at a tree and you see a hole in the ground there. I mean, there are, there are animals that chew on roots, but, you know, unless you're dealing with a, a very small plant, if we're talking about trees, and I know we're talking about soil and not specifically trees, but yeah. I can't imagine that a, unless it's a very small tree that you'd have irreparable damage from that. Um, yeah. I'm not sure, sure what animal would live just under a layer of pine straw either, but I guess it's possible. Yeah, that was our theory. We don't, we cannot prove it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but my point with that um, I, there, you might pick a, a certain kind of mulch over another and for situations like sure, that. Sure. The, the free stuff is best. And there's, there's, um, I, I prefer if possible, um, when I say hardwood mulch, I don't mean specifically from an oak tree or a poplar versus a pine, but something from the tree, some substantial part of chipped up organic matter. Because the decomposition is what we what we want. And pine straw is effective. Pine straw is a layer of something on top of the earth. It keeps moisture in, but it also, you know, it, pine needles are raked up off the forest floor. The, the, the pine trees have reabsorbed everything they can out of those needles. They cast the needles off. They lay on the forest floor. We rake them up. We bundle them up and they're easy to transport and they look nice and clean, but they don't quite have the same breakdown decomposition that organic, not even organic, like organic, but just true wood mulch would have. So I, I think personally, I think mulch wood chips is better, are better than pine straw and are better than, you know, maybe pine bark chips, that type of thing. But, you know, if you like to look at pine straw and someone tells you that, then you can put a layer of mulch down and then you can put pine straw on top to get the aesthetic benefits of that. But I, I think any blend of like leaves and twigs and like the, the, the branches that are chipped up, that's the best thing. Plus it's free, um, you know, you, ways you can get it. Um, you know, I know there's always been, oh, DeKalb County's got that huge pile. You can go and get it out of the pile at some places or um, your neighbors might have a, a tree service at their house. Um, be careful if you ask a tree service for mulch, you may get more than you bargained for. You might get uh, you might get a huge pile that you'll never be able to get to the bottom of. Um, so if someone ever needs a small amount, I usually recommend they go to a tree company and just get a trash can full. Um, from, some, from time to time, you can find someone that's had a stump ground. Um, a lot of times, you know, trees. Even if there are trees that died, if those if they mulch is ground into the earth, that can be really useful um, top dressing for mulch on a property. Mulch, I think we've it's like the solution to so many things for our trees. Um, you mentioned, yeah, you mentioned earlier about you know a problem being compacted soil, and it raised the question of how do you if you have a big tree, maybe those shallow roots, how do you un 
compact the soil around those roots? Yeah, so for a new tree planting, um, you're going to try to dig the hole a little bit bigger to better break up some of these dense, hardened clay soils that we have. Um, and then you plant it in an area that's nice and aerated and you mulch it over. Well, that's for putting a new tree in a property. Um, you can't do that for an established tree because there's roots in that soil. So there are some tools that can be used for decompacting. You know, when we plant a vegetable garden, we get out there with the, with the tiller, you know, the big blade that turns the soil up. Well, if that big blade is going through soil, it's also going to chop up all the roots. And the idea behind decompacting soil is to allow roots to grow. We don't want to damage them and they can't regrow. So um, there's, an, there's a tool called an air spade or an air knife. Um, they're kind of one and the same. They attach to an air compressor. It's not something you're going to go to Home Depot and rent from the rent center. You're going to have to, you're going to have to hire an arborist to help you with that. Um, but those tools can be used to turn um, compacted soils back into something that is more suitable for fibrous roots to grow. Because there's two different styles of root systems. There's two different styles. There's two components of a root system. There's the structural root plate. Those are the anchoring roots right around the tree. Those can be as far as 12, 15 feet from the tree on a big one. And then there's the critical root zone and that's where all the fine little feeder roots are. So what you're trying to do with decompaction is to loosen the soil to encourage more fibrous roots to grow all those little guys that are absorbing water and nutrients that we're putting into the soil. Cause you can fertilize all you want, but if there aren't roots under the ground to pull that in and move them to the tree where they can be used, then we're not doing much good. Okay. So it's what we're hearing is, you know, the soil is ultimately how you keep a tree healthy um, from the ground up. How would, folks find companies, organizations that really specialize in maintaining good soil health for trees? What are they looking for, for, for those companies? How would you answer those questions when you get those, Susan? Uh, there's, think, there's some good organizations to start with. Yeah, um, I always start at the Georgia Arborist Association page to get ideas and then I mean, since I work for Trees Atlanta, I already have some experience, but I think a good way to do it is to look at the Georgia Arborist Association and figure out who's in your area and then search for them. First of all, check out their page and see what they offer and then look for reviews for them as well. Another way is to ask your neighbors, of course, for recommendations. We, I see a lot of recommendations for arboriculture companies on Nextdoor and any kind of listserv like that so that you can hear from people as to whether they had a good experience or not with the company. Yeah. That, yeah, I, this, I mean, this comments. definitely isn't, it's not an advertisement for Butte Tree, but I can say that a lot of our um, appointments are a lot of the new clients that call us, find us on next door, or they just see us working in a neighbor's house or something like that. But the Georgia Arborist Association um, has a page for members um, you know, there's the International Society of Arboricultures, the ISA. That's, that's the accreditation um, portion of the industry. There's also the Tree Care Industry Association. So there's lots of letters and names there, I know. But the ISA and the GAA are two places to start. And you just want to make sure that you, have, that you find a company that um, has certified arborists on staff, and I would suggest finding a company that offers an array of services. Um, not, you know, I'm not so sure that there are, there are specialized companies out there that just do removal. And those are, those are qualified companies that can provide that service, but they may not be the best company to address soil compaction. So, you know, asking to see if they offer a wide array of services is a good, is a, is a good question to ask. Um, and then, of course, there's, I have to promote this as far as the safety of the industry, because I know we're talking about soil care, and it's not, you know, you don't think about safety when you're thinking about fertilization, but making sure that the company has the right 
general liability and workers' compensation insurance, make sure that you're protected. Because if you have soil care, you may be doing something else. And um, we often joke that if someone's wearing a hard hat, that's a good sign. They're not wearing hard hats and doing tree care, maybe not fertilization, but tree care, like the pruning services and the removal services. You might have someone that is not following every single last little rule. So that's kind of like the one thing I say, that's the litmus test. Are they wearing a hard hat to do tree work? Then they're, at least they're on the right, on the right path. I like that the Georgia Arborist Association gives individuals a chance to list their services as well. So you can see what they mm -hmm. offer. Um, when you're looking at that list yeah. and you can see who's a consulting arborist versus like a tree service company, depending on what you need. Yeah. And the consulting arborist is a part of an industry that's growing. There's a number of them in Atlanta right now that are really, really qualified. Um, and that wasn't the case 15 years ago. It just wasn't something that was, that was out there, but a consultant is someone that um, likely would not have a crew that would follow up and do the work that the recommendations were were. So, if you call if you call a company, they're going to come out. They're going to give you some advice. They're going to spend ten minutes with you, thirty minutes with you. Um, but at the end of it, they're also going to more than likely write you a proposal for services. Um, homeowners can ask for a consultation, and that way they're paying for our time. And we offer those services. You come out, you pay for my time to come out and spend an hour with you on your property. And what I leave you with is a list of recommendations not a proposal so sometimes that makes people feel a little more comfortable that the you know we're not out there just pitching something and consultants pretty much just do that um you know you know solely they're just out there providing their knowledge to help you with whatever you might need with your plants and trees thanks for sharing that link i'll try to pop that into the chat in just a little bit for the arborist um Georgia Arborists. Um, there, I'll, we'll get I'll put it in there. Oh, I, great. Yeah. So another question we have is, it's a little bit kind of changing gears a tiny bit. Can grading for a sloped yard be done in a way that will protect the tree roots? Um, I need to know this too. So, I think there, there's different types of soil like disturbance, root zone disturbance. I mean, some of it's cutting roots, we all know that. Some of it's um, compaction when we drive equipment over an area that squishes the soil down. Um, disturbance is also adding soil on top, not one or two inches just to cover up that pesky root that you're tripping over and mowing over, but talking about covering a large area with a lot of earth. And adding soil to the top of a root system um, can starve that root system that's, I mean, this is worth mentioning, the roots are only in the top 10, 12 inches of the soil. They're right there at the top, just under, the, um, that's where the air in the water is. So if you add five inches of soil to 10 inches of roots, you're really limiting the amount of air in the water that can get down into that root system. If it's a small area, you can get away with it. Um, but if it's a large area, you might be doing, you know, damage to the tree that we won't see for several years. So if you have a tree that's 75 years old or 15 years old, you, you, you grade an area, you change the soil environment. We may not see that tree show any symptoms of stress for a year, two years, five years down the road. So if you do plan to add something more than just an inch or two of soil and it's across a large area, um, you know, call an arborist and see what they had to say. Good advice. Good advice. Great. Thank you, Tyler. Another kind of construction related question is we're about to renovate the house. How do we protect the tree roots that are in our yard during construction? Well, well, we've all seen the orange fences around town. I yeah, mean, there's laws. At the start. <laughs> yeah. So if you're, if you're doing construction, more than likely, like for the city of Atlanta, for example, the arborist division in the city of Atlanta is underneath the buildings. So any, any permit that you might pass or, or request is going to have to be reviewed by an arborist. 
and there are there are codes written where you need to put that tree safe fence and the tree safe fence is the orange fence that is in all sorts of conditions you know we've seen them upright we've seen them laying on the ground we see them balled up in the corner in the property so follow what the city what the municipality says um, and just know that whatever is approved on the plan as far as where they're going to put the fence that's the minimum amount you should be doing you can always do more and so what that tree safe fence is supposed to do that orange fence sometimes it's a chain link fence sometimes you see hay bales i have a photo here somewhere that i might share um, if it's helpful is they're just trying to keep people out of that area because it's not just the it's not just the big heavy equipment that does damage it's the pallets of material you know if one pallet of, of, of brick or put on top of a root system and then it's taken off and then the next day someone brings roofing material put it back puts it back on the, the root system it can compact it over time construction can last for months and months and vehicles is probably going to be vehicles, vehicles it can be the yeah. it can be the painters that are pouring out you know washed out buckets there's there's all those different levels of, of construction disturbance um and it's just over time it just takes a beating and so you know the tree safe fence keeps people away from the tree it's supposed to um you know every once in a while something gets put in the middle of it so if people are if contractors aren't going to follow the rules or maybe someone sneaks into that tree save area um back to the mulch can answer every question with you better put mulch down on your trees a layer of mulch can insulate and in a lack of a better term just it can insulate the soil it can if something does get put down on top of the earth it's not going to compact the soil nearly as bad so you know it can mulch can actually you know a lot more mulch than you typically would put on a root system after your, your property is landscaped can protect soil great thank you um just a reminder to folks um we're have coming up to kind of our last few questions so if you had anything that you wanted to share um, in the q a we're, we're continually adding those to our list and or the chat option. So be sure to get those in there. We'll get to our last few ones coming up now. If I have mushrooms or fungus growing on the ground around my trees, is that a good or bad sign regarding how healthy the soil is? Oh, well, it could be either or. <laughs> <laughs> well, so Christy, you mentioned Christy earlier, she always recommends taking photos and documenting your, your fruiting bodies of your fungal friends in your yard to, to be able to see whether they come back in the same place every year. Mm -hmm. So if it's coming back in the exact same place every year, it could be related to roots, right? Uh, but if it's like moving around your yard, then it's more likely related to uh, some other like decaying material in your yard, like mulch or leaves or something. But yeah, what else? I mean, it could, we're, look, we're looking for, we want decomposition. We want organic matter to be decomposing to feed the soil um, to create all those beneficial bacteria and fungi. You know, the decomposition of organic matter adds nutrients back into the, the soil. So part of that process, a mushroom is a decomposer. I mean, one of the things I say I ask is, is it, is it attached to the tree or not? There are some root decay fungi that aren't right on the base of the tree they're a little bit further out but if they're attached at the base of the tree on what's called the flare where the trunk goes down and goes out in the root system that's that's usually not a good sign if it's just in the top layer of mulch you know get a shovel down there just stick your hand down in the mulch if it's just in the top layer of the mulch it might not be so bad it might be one of those beneficial decomposers that you want and you'll get some funky looking stuff growing out of the wood mulch. It's not, I mean, it's the forest floor. It's not always, that's why pine straw is sometimes, you know, what people want is because it looks pretty and it's clean. So oh, mulch can have that. some funky looking stuff. Yeah. They don't like the dog vomit looking fungal food bodies. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that's about right. that, why people like pine straws. 
It's just clean. And it's easy to transport. I, look, I, as much as I'm promoting mulch, I have pine straw in my front yard. It's because I can throw it in the back of the truck. It sits back there for a while. It's light. It's easy to get. You know, it's expensive when you're doing 100 bales of pine straw, but it can be relatively inexpensive if you just have one or two bales, if you're just touching up an area. So it, it's, it has its time and the place, for sure. The, the photo, that's a great recommendation, Susan, for people to document it over time to see, you know, if it's a steady thing and, and um, I think good, good tip. Um, here's one, uh, I think everyone could relate. Are there any better trees that can survive in our Georgia red clay? Are there ones that they should be, you know, sourcing versus others? Oh my God, so many trees can grow here. We are so lucky. <laughs> my... My poor sister lives out in Denver and she's tried to plant a tree in her yard and she called me and she was just sounded so sad at her options available because she lives in like a, in a short grass prairie. But uh, yeah, we have, clay is actually really wonderful. It holds on to moisture really well. Um, of course, like clearly we have driven home during this entire session that you do need that organic layer on top to help um, promote more of the biology and the life in the soil. But um, I mean, just look to all of our native species that grow here in the Piedmont and do well, then it's a lot of great options. I don't think we're very limited. I, you know, there's, is, there's not one tree that comes to mind. It's like, oh, that tree. But, you know, and if, if I mention, it's like mentioning, mentioning one tree company in Atlanta that's better than another. Um, but, trees there my my earbud is telling me that i'm running out of power we can still hear you, can you still hear me susan yeah you're still good but yeah we yeah. have I and mean, we have hundreds of choices which is amazing if you're looking for something easy to grow i would pick one of the like faster growing pioneer species some of our trees that come in when an area is disturbed quickly so um the things that come in first like like sweet gums and pine trees. Uh, those are really great for getting started. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're worried about poor soils because they'll help repair yeah. the soil. I mean, there are certainly some trees out there and they're not ones that you're going to find at a box store. I mean, like a swamp white oak. I mean, there, there are certain varieties of trees that have been shown to withstand urban stresses um, more than others for sure. Um, but there's not just one tree to be like, Hey, there's a really bad soil. I'm going to go get this great tree to put in the bad soil. I'd recommend you improve the soil because even though they're clay, clays are really nutrient rich. Um, we just need to sometimes add organic matter to it. Sometimes we need to something in between all of those fine little particles of clay to keep it loose, to keep air and water moving into it. I mean, a soil is made up. If the soil is 100%, I mean, it's made up of 5% organic matter, 45% mineral, 25% air, and 25% water. So we're forgetting about half the soil, which is air and water. So we think of soil being nutrients and clay, but that's, it's all about having something that's open and loose for all those fine feeder roots to go through. And no, a tree can't, a mature tree can't live in totally loose soil it would just fall out of the ground we, we you know the entire thing doesn't have to be loose but we need some way to break it up to get air and water down in there to let those roots survive i think a lot Thanks. of the species that oh sorry we end up planting a trees atlanta that do really well as street trees and are like our more urban areas at our bottomland species that are already used to surviving on less oxygen in the soil having mm -hmm. less oxygen available to the roots so some of those trees that have naturally developed in areas that have long periods of inundation or, or um, flooding seem to do really well. Yeah, like what, what some rice, like Sweet Bay Magnolia, that might be one. Oh yeah, I hadn't thought about that one. But yeah, like you mentioned the Swamp White Oak and Swamp Chestnut and um, mm -hmm. I mean, clearly red maples are really tough because they get planted so yes. much. But um, Overcup Oak, and nut all oak or other ones that are really tough mm -hmm. and bald cypress. Mm -hmm. A lot of those 
floodplain species and swamp species, black gum. Yeah, that's about. a really good point. And even though the little right of way strip where so many street trees are planted is not a wet area, the it's it's the lack of oxygen that those trees have. So yes, it might be the driest spot around, but it also those root systems can tolerate areas where there's not a whole lot of oxygen. There's not a whole lot of oxygen when when soils are tightly compacted together. Is that about right? Yeah. yeah. Yep. So you mentioned kind of the roots um, and thinking about um, uprooting uh, during storms. Someone's mentioning, you know, we see a lot of, of trees that will uproot. Is this a sign that the soil is bad in that area or is that unrelated to soil health or a combination? I guess it could be. So if a tree falls over in a storm and it's, it's called, it's a, it's a failure at the base of the tree. Um, look at it. Does the tree pull soil up with it or does the tree snap off at the base? And if the tree snaps off at the base, there was more than likely a defect there where there was decay working its way up from the root system, which those mushrooms might show you root decay, or there's decay working their way down from the top. If a tree falls over and it looks like a turkey fan is sticking above the ground or lots of soil and rock, lots of roots are exposed. That's a combination of a lot of rain and the right dust to wind. And something that could contribute to that is, um, you know, just when speaking about soil, could just be the change in, in drainage in the area with more and more construction, more and more water, you know, the change of the way the water flows on the property. You know, if you're downhill from 10 brand new homes or 10 renovations, more than likely that those gutter systems and those drainage areas are probably redirecting water maybe to a spot that never was there before. And sometimes you can see that contribute to saturated soils, really, really wet soils. Maybe that tree wasn't used to having that much rain all, you know, displaced and put right on the base of the tree. So it may, it may not be, or maybe the tree had a lean or there was two twin trees, two trees together and one tree, you know, was removed for whatever reason and exposed the other tree to some more wind. So there's a combination of things there. Great, thank you. Well, that is the, the last of the questions um, that were submitted via Q&A ahead of time and in chat. Is there anything else that you wanted to add regarding soil health and trees um, for folks that are listening, Susan or Tyler? Tyler, did you want to talk any about soil horizons or? Yeah, I can okay. do that. I mean, I guess, you know, we're, we're talking about trees, you know, we're, we're, this is a trees Atlanta meeting. So we're all in Atlanta, I'm guessing. And we're probably thinking and asking questions about our own properties. Um, some, some people like me, I live on a tiny little posted stamp lot. Some of us live in condos and we're having community trees, but Urban soils are not quite what trees have out in the woods. And anything we're doing with mulch or fertilization or decompaction or all these other tools that we have at our disposal, we're trying to recreate what a tree would have out in the woods. And so if I can do this here, I'm going to try to share my screen. Is that successful there? Yes, yes. you can see it. Okay, so, you know, this is not the forest. This is what maybe was your our front yard now. So this is a home that's being built, um, mixed in um, brick in here, compacted red clay. So the soil, that, the dirt that's on the top used to be 10 feet below the surface. So I had a soil course in school, soil science, and there's a difference between soil and dirt. And a lot of times our urban soils are just compacted dirt. So this is what we might be trying to plant a tree in. It's not really ideal. And you can take a look, if you guys can see my cursor, a little bit of what this, what composes this soil is it's the same color all the way through. And what we really are trying to create 
And so and we don't have to get into the whole technical aspects of what a, each horizon is, but we're trying to look at, there's different levels of earth. And down here at the very bottom, you know, you have bedrock, very compacted areas, areas that don't have a whole lot of organic matter in them. But at the very, very top is you have all this decomposing organic matter. It's nice and loose. It's full of um, nutrients. It's full of all that, you know, micro life that we were talking about. There's beneficial fungi that are attached to roots called mycorrhizae. And these are areas of soil that you're just not going to be able to recreate unless you have about 30 years on your hand. And, you, you know, you're constantly putting new layers of mulch on top and letting it break down. So you can see how the color and a little bit of the density changes as it goes down. And this is just year after year of decomposing matter. And the roots are right in the top and they're really living in that one or two, three first layers of soil. Um, and here, you know, it's saying herbaceous growth and then litter and below that, um, you know, you have these A and the E. The E is really even lower where most roots are not going to live. But, you know, this is a, this is a tree stay fence, not the best looking tree stay fence. But this is what we try to consider, um, you know, saving a tree, but it's pretty rough territory out here with a mix of construction materials, right? Um, and you're only going to have those soil horizons when you have, you know, the forest like this. So, you know, I thought it was a good representation of what we're trying to recreate. And so, you know, layers and constantly kind of putting a new fresh layer of mulch on top of, of the ground can start to recreate that first six inches where we, um, we might have some good growth or, or some good soil that's favorable for, um, for fibrous roots. Yeah, those are great visuals. I'm in that repair time. Our house is only about 20 years old. So we're just trying yeah. to mimic what would have happened in a forest now by putting the mulch and leaving leaves and all of that. It's going to take mm -hmm. a while. And this, and this is soil management. We all start at different levels. So it, all we're trying to do is make small improvements. So if we have a really, really good soil, we have an area you know, it's an older home. It's never really been disturbed. Um, maybe we don't have to do much. Maybe we are talking about soil testing. We're making the small improvements, but, you know, soil management, you can make a lot of headway in a short amount of time if you incorporate mulch or if you have it, if you can put the time and the energy and sometimes the financial investment into air tilling, which is that air spade air tool, you can, you can make a lot of headway at the very beginning, but it all falls back to mulch. It's free. It's something you can do on your own. It doesn't have to be done all at once. It can be a little baby steps. You can be the weekend warrior that's out there spreading a little bit. And then Mother Nature takes care of the rest. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to share my screen really quick as we wrap up. Um, a big thank you to Tyler from Boutte Trees um, for, for sharing all of your knowledge with us. Thank you, Susan from Trees Atlanta for sharing all of your um, experience and knowledge with us today. Uh, I wanted to just remind folks, um, thinking about how we can continue to offer these programs, what you're looking for, how we can give you the information you're looking for for your, your situation. So you'll get a, a survey. Please take time to, to, to fill that out and return it. And also just want to let you know some ways you can follow along for additional uh, opportunities of programs. Our next Ask the Arborist series is gonna come up on June 16th, and you can register for that on our Trees Atlanta website. And Susan mentioned uh, a couple programs that you could get involved with our pruning classes, as well as our tree keeper and our forest stewardship classes. Those are also all on the treesatlanta.org website. Um, any last thoughts, Susan or Tyler? No, oh, I thank you guys to all the participants who came. We appreciate your time to learn more about our soils and tree care in general. And I hope to see you guys out the volunteer project sometime. 
And Tyler, Excellent. thank you thank very, you. very thank much. We you. really appreciate your expertise and taking the time to share. Yeah, reach out anytime. Excellent. Thank you so much and uh, have a great rest of your day. Bye. Bye.